Thank you. So um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Decameron, so I'll just give you sort of a, um, a breakdown of what it is and what we're here to do. So in 1350, Giovanni Boccaccio wrote a, uh, a book called the Decameron, and it's a collection of 100 stories. And so the, um, it takes place right after, or right as the plague is happening. And seven women and three men go and hide out in the countryside to avoid the plague. And for every night that they're there, which is 10 nights, each one tells a story. So every one of the stories that we're reading is one person in particular story. And so I used uh, one story in particular, the one I'm reading, and then sort of details from the other two stories uh, in, in the movie. Actually, only his story, I think, has a detail. So we're going to begin with uh, day three, story one, and then move on to day story two, and then day three, story three. So these are all in order. Does everyone understand what's going to happen? Yeah, does anyone have any questions before we get started? <laughs> yeah, this is so official. Let's have a good time. All right, here we go, the Decameron. <laughs> day three, story one. Here in the countryside of ours, there was and still is a convent quite renowned for holiness which I will not name in order to dis diminish its reputation in any way. Not so long ago, it has only eight nuns and their abbess, all of them still young women, all well as, good, as well as a good little guy who tended their resplendent garden. Not content with his salary, he settled his accounts with the nun's steward and returned to his native village of Lamprecchio. Among others who gave him a warm welcome home, there was a young laborer named Masetto, who was strong and hardy and for a peasant, quite mm -hmm. handsome. So that's, in the movie, that's Dave. <laughs> he asked a good man, whose name was Nuto, where he had been for such a long time. And after Nuto, Nuto told him, Masetto wanted to know how he was employed in the convent. I used to work in a great, big, beautiful garden of theirs, replied Nuto. And besides that, I sometimes used to go to the forest for firewood, or I'd draw water and do other little chores of that sort. But the women gave me such a small salary that I hardly had enough to pay for shoe leather. And another thing, they're all young, and I think they all had the devil inside of them, because no matter what I did, it never suited them. Sometimes when I was working in the vegetable garden, one of them would say, put this here, and another would say, put that there, and yet a third would snatch the hoe from my hand and tell me, you're doing it all wrong. And they'd make themselves such a pain that I'd stop working and leave the garden. Well, what with one thing and another, I decided it was time to quit. As I was about to set off to come back here, their steward asked me to see whether I could find somebody who did that sort of work when I got home, and if so, he told me I should send the guy to, to, to him. Although I did promise him that I'd do it, I'm not going to, because unless God gives the guy one heck of a constitution, you won't find me sending him there. As he listened to Nuda's story, Masato was filled with such a desire to go and spend time with those nuns that it completely consumed him, for it was clear from what he had heard he would have no difficulty in getting just what he wanted out of them. But realizing that his plan would go nowhere if he told Nudo anything about it, he said, it was such a good idea of yours to come back here. What kind of life can a man lead when he's surrounded by women? He'd be better off with a pack of devils. Six times out of seven, they themselves don't even know what they want. Once they had finished talking, Macedo started thinking about what he needed to do in order to get to stay in the nunnery. Since he knew he was capable of doing the chores mentioned by Nudo, he, know, he had no worries about being rejected on that score but he was afraid that he would not be hired because he was too young and too attractive. After having pondered a number of options, an idea occurred to him. The place is pretty far away, and no one there knows me. If I pretend I'm a deaf mute, maybe they'll take me on for sure. Having settled on this plan, he dressed himself up like a poor man, slung one of his axes over his shoulder, and without telling anyone anywhere where he was going, set off for the convent. When he arrived and entered the courtyard, he chanced to come upon the steward and by using signs the way deaf mutes do, made a show of him, asking him for the love of God to give him something to eat in return, for he would chop whoever, whatever wood they ha happened to need. The steward was perfectly willing to feed him, after which he presented him with a pile of logs that Nudo had not been able to split. But that Maseto, who was quite strong, managed to take care of it in no time at all. The steward had to go into the forest, and taking Maseto along with him, he had him cut some firewood, while he himself went to bring up the donkey, and by, and, and by making certain signs, got Masato to understand that he was to haul it all back to the convent. Masato acquitted himself so well that he, the steward asked him for several more days in order to take care of some chores, and he needed to have done. And it was one of those days that the abbess saw him and asked the steward who he was. My lady, said the steward, he's a poor deaf mute, one, one of who came here two days ago begging for alms, and not only did I give him some, but I've had him take care of a bunch of chores that needed doing. 
If he knew how to tend to the garden and wanted to stay on, I'm convinced he'd do good work out there because he's just what we need, a strong man who could be made to do our bidding. Besides, you wouldn't have to worry about him joking around with these young ladies of yours. I swear to God, said the abbess, you're telling the truth. Find out if he knows how to garden and do your very best to make him stay here. Give him a pair of shoes, just some old hood or other, and be sure to flatter him and pamper him and give him plenty to eat. The steward said he would take care of it. Mosetto was not very far away, and although he was pretending to sweep the courtyard, he was really eavesdropping on their entire conversation. Once you put me inside there, he said to himself gleefully, I'm going to work your garden for your better, for your better and it's not even been worked before. After the steward had confirmed that Mosetto really knew how to do the work, he asked him by means of gestures if he wanted to stay on, and Mosetto, using gestures to reply, said he would do whatever the steward wanted. The steward therefore hired him and ordered him to go and work in the garden, showing what he needed to do there, after which he left Masetto alone and went to attend to other business for the convent. As Masetto worked there day and day, the nuns started pestering him and making fun of him, something people frequently do with deaf mutes. And since they were certain he could not understand him, they did not hesitate to use the worst language in the world in front of him. For her part, the abbess paid little or no attention to what they were doing, perhaps because she was under the impression that Masetto had lost his tail just as he had lost his tongue. One day, after he had been working really hard and, and taking a rest, two young nuns who were walking through the garden happened to, appro to approach the spot where he was lying. Since he appeared to be asleep, they gave him a good looking over, and the bolder of the two said to the other, if I thought you could keep a secret, I'd share a an idea with you that's often crossed my mind, and that might work out to our mutual benefit. Don't worry about telling me, the other replied, because I'm certainly not going to reveal it to anyone else. Then the bold one began, I don't know if you've ever spent much time thinking about how strictly we're confined here and how the only men that ever dare set foot inside the convent are the steward who's elderly and this deaf mute. Now I've often heard of many women who come to visit us, now I've often heard many of the women who come to visit us that all the, out of all the pleasures in the world, a joke are, are a joke compared to the one women experience when they're with a man. That's why I frequently thought putting it to the test with this deaf mute here, seeing how nobody else is available. He's actually the best one in the world for it because he couldn't reveal it even if he wanted to. In fact, he couldn't even know how since you can see he's just a big dumb clod whose body's grown a lot faster than his brain. Anyway, I'd be glad to know what you think about all this. Oh my goodness, said the other, what are you saying? Don't you know that we've promised our virginity to God? Oh, replied the first, think about how many promises are made to him every day and not one of them is ever kept. So what if we've ever made promises to him? He can always find lots of others who will keep theirs. But what if we get pregnant, said her companion. What will we do then? You're beginning to worry about diff difficulties before they've even happened, replied the other. If and when they occur, that'll be the time to think about them. And there are a thousand ways to keep people from getting wind of what's going on, provided we don't talk about it ourselves. With every word, her companion's desires became ever greater to find out what sort of beast a man might be. So how will we do it, she asked. As you see, it's just about nuns, the other replied. And I'm sure that all the sisters are sleeping except for us. Let's have a look around the garden to see if anyone's here, and if there isn't, all we have to do is take him by the ha hands and lead him to this hut where he says he will want to get out of the rain. Then one of us can go inside with him while the other stands guard, and such a simpleton he is that he'll do whatever we want. Having heard their entire conversation, Macedo was quite eager to obey and was only waiting for one of the nuns to come and get him. Meanwhile, the nuns had a good look around, and when they were sure that, that they could not be seen from any direction, the one who had initiated their conversation approached Misetto and woke him up. He got to his feet right away, at which point she seized his hand and with all sorts of seductive gestures led him, giggling like an idiot, to the hut where he did not need an invitation to do her bidding. When she had gotten what she wanted, like the loyal friend she was, she made way for her companion, and Misetto, still playing the simpleton, did what they asked him to do. And before the two of them finally left, each one made additional trials of just how good a rider the deaf mute was. Later on, talking it over with another, they, greeted, they agreed that the experience was really as sweet as people said it was, if not more so. And from then on, whenever the opportunity presented itself, they went and amused themselves with Masetto. One day, it just so happened that one of the sisters saw what they were up to from a window of her cell and showed the spectacle to two others. At first, they thought to denounce the pair to the abbess, but then they changed their minds and worked out an arrangement with the first two nuns whereby they could all share in Masetto's farm. <laughs> And at different times, by a variety of routes, the last three nuns came to join them. Finally, on a particularly hot day, the abbess, who was still unaware of these goings-on, walk, was walking by herself through the garden when she came upon Masetto. Because of all the riding he had been doing at night, even the little bit of work he engaged in during the day was proving too much for him. And so there he lay, fast asleep, stretched out under the shade of the almond tree. 
the front part of his tunic was blown back by the wind, leaving him entirely exposed. And the abbess, who found herself quite alone, kept staring at it until she succumbed to the same carnal appetite that the first two nuns had experienced. Consequently, she woke Misetto and took him with her back to her room, where she kept him for several days, <laughs> thereby provoking serious complaints on the part of the nuns because the gardener had stopped coming to work in the garden. After repeatedly sampling the very sweetness she used to criticize in other, women's before, in other women before them, the abbess, abbess finally sent Misetto back to his own room. Still, she wanted to have him return again and again and was getting more than her fair share out of him until Misetto, who was unable to satisfy many women, realized that his playing the deaf mute could wind up causing him irreparable damage if he continued to do so much longer. <laughs> Consequently, one night, when he was with the abbess, he untied his tongue and began to speak. My lady, it's my understanding that one cock is enough for ten hens, but that ten men will have a hard time satisfying one woman, and yet it's my job to offer services to no fewer than nine of them. Well, there's no way in the world I can keep doing it any longer, and as a matter of fact, from doing what I've been doing up to now, I've reached the point where I can't, do it just, I can't just do about anything anymore. So you should either say goodbye to me and let me go or find some way to solve this problem. Since the abbess had already thought she, he was a deaf mute, she was completely dumbfounded when she heard him speak. What's all this, she asked. I thought you were a deaf mute. I really was, my lady, replied Misato, but I wasn't born that way. I lost the ability to speak because of an illness, and I thank God from the bottom of my heart that on this very night, for the very first time, I've managed to recover it. <laughs> the abbess believed his story and then asked him what he meant when he said that he had to offer his services to nine of them. Misato explained how things stood, and as the abbess listened, she realized that all of her nuns were much smarter than he was. Being a prudent woman, she then decided that rather than let Misato go, in which case he might say something damaging to the reputation of the convent, she would work out some sort of arrangement with her nuns. Their old steward had recently died, and so with Misato's consent, now that they all knew that they had all been doing what they all had been doing in the past, the nuns decided unanimously to persuade the people living there and thereabouts that although Misato had been long a deaf mute, his speech has been restored through their prayers and through the intervention of the saint for whom the convent was named. Furthermore, they made Misato their steward, but dividing up his labors in such a way that he could take care of them all, and although he sired quite a few monklets and, monk and nunlets, the whole matter was handled with such discretion that no one heard about, it, heard about it at all until the death of the abbess at a time when Misato, now pretty well off, was approaching, uh, approaching old age and was eager to return home. And once they knew what he wanted, he easily obtained their permission to go. Thus, because he was clever and had figured out how he could put his youth to good use, Misato had come home from Leprechio with nothing more than an ax in his shoulder, re returned, oh, sorry, let me start that over. Thus, because he was clever and had figured out how he could put all his uh, youth to good use, Misato, who had come from Leprechio with nothing more than an axe on his shoulder, returned home a rich old man who had fathered numerous children, but spared himself the trouble of feeding them and, exp and the expense of raising them. <laughs> and this was the way he maintained that Christ treated anyone who set a pair of cuckold horns on his crown. <laughs> so, uh, Only two more stories. <laughs> All right, day three, story two. Some people are so lacking in discretion that when they have discovered or heard about things that they were better off not knowing, they feel compelled to reveal their knowledge at any cost, with the result that they sometimes censure faults in others no one else would have noticed, and although their goal in doing so is to lessen their own shame, they actually increase it out of all proportion. And now, pretty ladies, what I propose is to prove the truth of this to you by actually describing the contrary state of affairs in which the wisdom of a worthy king was matched by the cleverness of a man whose social position may have been even lower than Macedo's. When he became king of the Lombards, Agilolf followed the example of his ancestors and chose Pavia, a city in Lombardy, as the seat of his reign. Having meanwhile married Theodolinda, you better remember all these names, uh, who was the widow of uh, Thori, the former Lombard ruler. An exceptionally beautiful woman, Theodolinda was both wise and very honest, but she had a stroke of very bad luck with a man who had fallen in love with her. <clears throat> 
At a time when Lombardy had been enjoying a long period of peace and prosperity, thanks to the valor and wisdom of King Agalof, it just so happened that one of the queen's grooms, a man who was as tall and handsome as the king himself, fell for her and loved her to distraction. Though of exceedingly low birth, the groom was in other respects vastly superior to his base occupation. And since his lowly condition did not prevent him from seeing that this love of his went well beyond the bounds of, pro of propriety, he wisely refrained from disclosing it to anyone and did not even dare to cast a re revealing glances in the lady's direction. Nevertheless, although he lived without any hope of ever winning her favor, deep inside he gloried that he had raised his thoughts to such a lofty height. Burning all over in love's fire, he showed himself more zealous than any of his companions in doing whatever he thought would give the queen pleasure. And thus, it came about that because the queen preferred to ride the palfrey that was in his care rather than in any of the others, uh, whenever she was obliged to go out on horseback, on those occasions, the groom felt that she was doing him the greatest of favors and would stand close by her stirrup, thinking himself blessed if he was merely able to touch her clothing. However, what we see all too often is that a hope diminishes, love increases, and that is what happened with the poor groom, to the extent that, without a shred of hope to sustain him, he had the utmost difficulty controlling the powerful desire he kept hidden inside him, and uh, on more than one occasion, being unable to free himself from the passion, he felt like killing himself. As he pondered the ways and means to do just that, he concluded that the circumstances leading up to his death should be such as to make everyone understand that it was the result of the love he had always borne for the queen. At the same time, he was resolved to try his luck and see if those circumstances might also offer him an opportunity to wholly, or at least partially, gratify his desires. He had no intention of saying anything to the queen or declaring his love for her by means of letters, for he realized that speaking or writing to her would be in vain. And so, instead, he concentrated on getting into her bed by means of some stratagem or other. Since he knew that the king did not spend every single night with his wife, he concluded that the one and only stratagem with a chance of success was for him to find some way to impersonate the king so that he would be free to approach her and gain access to her bedroom. With the aim of discovering how the king was dressed and the routine he followed when he visited the queen, the groom hid himself for several nights in a great hall of the palace that was situated between the two royal bedchambers. On one of those nights, he saw the king come out of his room, wrapped in a large cloak, carrying a small lighted torch in one hand and a rod in the other. He walked over to the queen's chamber and without saying a word, knocked once or twice at the entrance with the rod, whereupon the door was opened at once and the torch was taken from his hand. Having observed what the king had done and having likewise seen him return to his room some time later, the groom decided he would adopt the very same procedure. He managed to acquire a cloak that resembled the king's as well as a torch and a stick. And after first washing himself thoroughly in a hot bath so that the odor of dung would not repel the queen or make her suspect a trick, he took his things to the great hall and did himself and hid himself in the usual place. <laughs> Didn't masturbate in the usual place. So this is the uh, third, third day, uh, second story. When the groom thought that everyone was asleep and that the time had come for him either to gratify his desires or to find a noble path to the, to the death he had long sought, he used a piece of flint and steel he had brought with him to make a small fire by means of which he lit his torch. Then, wrapping himself up tightly in his cloak, he walked over to the entrance of the bedroom and knocked twice with his rod. The door was opened for him by a chambermaid who, more asleep than awake, took his light and covered it up after which, without saying a thing, he stepped inside the curtains, took off his cloak, and got into the bed where the queen lay sleeping. Knowing that it was not the king's habit to engage in conversation whenever he was angry about something, the groom made a show of being irritated as he took the queen lustfully in his arms and then, without either one of them ever uttering a single word, he had carnal knowledge of her over and over again. Although he was very loath to leave her, he was afraid that if he stayed there too long, the joy he had experienced might be turned into sorrow. Consequently, he got up 
and after he had retrieved his cloak and his torch, he went away, still without saying a word, and returned to his bed as quickly as he could. The groom could scarcely have reached, uh, reached it when, to the queen's utter amazement, the king showed up in, the tr in her chamber and gave her a cheerful greeting as he got into bed with her. Oh, my lord, she said, encouraged by his good humor. What's the meaning of this change tonight? You've only just left me after having enjoyed me more than, the us than you usually do, and here you are coming back for more? You should be careful what you're doing. <laughs> On hearing these words, the king immediately inter inferred that the queen had been deceived by someone who had looked and behaved like him. He was a wise man. However, he was a wise man, however, and since neither she nor anyone else had noticed the substitution, he decided on the spot that he would not reveal it to her. Many a fool would have acted differently and said, that wasn't me. Who was the man who was here? What happened? Who was it who came? This would have given rise to a great many complications that would have upset the lady unnecessarily and might have given her reason to want to repeat the experience she had just had. <laughs> And besides, it allowed him to avoid disgracing himself by not talking about something that, as long as it remained unsaid, would never have been able to cause, would never have been able to cause him shame. Thus, giving no sign of his inner turmoil, turmoil, either by the way he spoke or by his facial expression, the king answered her, wife, don't you think I'm man enough to come back here a second time after having been with you once before? Yes, my lord, the lady replied, but nevertheless, I beg you to be careful with your health. I'm happy to follow your advice, said the king, and so this time I'll go away and won't bother you any further. As he picked up his cloak and left the room, the king was seething with rage, indignant over what he, he saw had been done to him, and determined to go quietly and search for the culprit, operating on the assumption that the man had to be a member of his household and that no matter who he was, he would not have been able to get out of the palace. Taking a little lantern that shed only a very faint light, he went to a long dormitory located over the palace stables where almost all of his servants were asleep, each in his own bed. And since he surmised that neither the pulse uh, nor the heart rate of whoever had done the deed reported by the queen could have returned to normal after all his exertions, the king started at one end of the room and began quietly walking along, feeling everyone's chest to see if it was still throbbing. Although all the others were sound asleep, the one who had been with the queen was still awake, and when he saw the king coming and realized what he was looking for, he became so frightened that the terror he felt made his heart, which, had already, uh, which was already pounding because of his recent exercise, beat even harder. He was absolutely convinced that if the king noticed it, he would be instantly put to death, and thoughts about various possible courses of action went, went racing through his mind. Upon observing, however, that the king was unarmed, he decided to pretend he was asleep and wait to see what the king would do. Having already examined a large number of the sleepers and concluded that none of, none of them were the man he was seeking, the king finally reached the groom. When he discovered how hard the man's heart was beating, he said to himself, this is the one. <laughs> however, he did not want to let anybody know what his intentions were. And so, the only thing he did was take a small pair of scissors he had brought with him and cut off a lock of hair on one side of the groom's head. Since people wore their hair very long in those days, that would be a sign by which the king would be able to recognize the culprit the next morning. Then, once he was done, he made his exit and returned to his own room. Having witnessed everything that had happened, the groom, who was very shrewd, had no doubt as to why he had been marked in this manner. Therefore, he did not hesitate for a moment, but got up, and having located one of the several pairs of scissors that, had happened, to be, uh, that happened to keep in the stables for tending to the horses, he went through the room from one man to the next as they lay sleeping and quietly cut off their hair just above the ear in the same way his own had been. Having finished what he was doing without having observed, been observed by anyone, he returned to his bed and went to sleep. The moment the king arose in the morning, he gave orders that the palace gate should remain closed until the members of his household were assembled before him. When they had all arrived and were standing bareheaded in his presence, he began looking them over with the intention of identifying the man whose hair he had cut off. To his amazement, however, he discovered that the vast majority of them had had their hair sheared in the exact same way. The man I'm looking for may well be low-born, he said to himself. 
but he's demonstrated that he has quite a lofty intellect. Then, since he realized that he could not achieve what he wanted without making a scene, he decided he would not expose himself to, uh, to so great a disgrace in order to take his revenge on so petty a person. Instead, he contented himself with giving the man a stern word of warning to show him that his deed had not gone, gone unobserved. Whoever did it, he said, addressing the entire assembly, he'd better not do it again. <laughs> now go, and may God be with you. Another man would have, been, would have had them all put on the strapado, tortured, examined, and interrogated. But in doing so, he would have brought out into the open something that people should, have, uh, should make every effort to conceal. For even if, by revealing the whole story, he had been able to revenge himself to the full, he would not have lessened his shame. On the contrary, he would have greatly increased it and would have sullied his lady's reputation to boot. Those who heard the king's speech were amazed by it. And for a long time afterward, they debated amongst themselves what he had meant. There was no one, however, who understood it except for the one person it really concerned. And he, wise man that he was, never revealed its meaning as long as the king was alive, nor did he ever put his life at risk by performing any such deed again. Hello. Uh, mine's the longest. <coughs> <coughs> Day three, story three. Not so many years ago in our city, which abounds more in trickery than in love or loyalty, there lived a noble lady who was adorned with beauty and good manners as well as being endowed by nature with as lofty a spirit and subtle an understanding as any woman has ever had. I have no intention of revealing her name or that of anyone else involved in this story, even though I know them all, because certain people who are still living would be extremely offended despite the fact that the whole thing should be passed off with a laugh. Possessing a distinguished pedigree and finding herself married off to a wool draper, the lady was incapable of laying to rest the contempt she felt for him by reason of his occupation, for she was firmly convinced that no man of low condition, however extraordinarily wealthy he might be, deserved to have a noble wife. And indeed, when she saw that for all his riches, the only things he was capable of doing were telling one kind of cloth from another or setting up a loom or haggling about yarn with the woman who did the spinning, she decided that she would no longer tolerate his embraces unless there were no way for her to deny them. Furthermore, she was determined to satisfy herself by finding someone worthier of her affection than she thought her wool draper of a husband was. And so it was that she fell deeply in love with an extremely attractive man around 35 years old, so deeply, in fact, that if she did not see him during the day, she could get no rest the following night. The gentleman, however, who knew nothing about what was going on, paid no attention to her, and since she was so very cautious, she did not dare to inform him about her feelings, either by writing to him or sending a maid servant as her emissary, for fear of the dangers this might entail. But having observed that he was often in the company of certain clergymen, a fat, coarse friar, who was nevertheless regarded by almost everyone as extremely worthy because of the very devout life he led, she decided that he would make an excellent go-between for her and the man she loved. And so, after having figured out the course of action she would take, at an appropriate hour, she went to the church to the friar, to, to the church which the friar was attached, and having sent for him, asked him if he would be willing to hear her confession. Since the friar could tell at a glance that she was a gentlewoman, he was happy to listen to her confession. When it was done, she said, Father, as I shall explain to you, there's another matter about which I felt obliged to come to you for aid and counsel. I've told you 
who my husband and my family are, and I feel certain that you must know them. Now, my husband loves me more than life itself, and since he's a very rich man, he has never the slightest difficulty or hesitation in giving me whatever I happen to desire. Consequently, I love him more dearly than life itself, and if I ever thought about acting contrary to his honor or his wishes, let alone actually doing so, I would be more deserving of hellfire than the most wicked woman who's ever lived. Now, there's a certain person who looks to me like a proper gentleman and who, unless I'm mistaken, spends a great deal of time in your company. I really don't know his name, but he's tall and handsome, dresses elegantly in dark brown clothing, and perhaps he's unaware of my disposition, appears to have laid siege on me. I can't go to a window or look out a door, let alone take a step outside my house that he doesn't immediately appear before me. In fact, I'm surprised that he's not here right now. In any case, all of this really upsets me, especially because such behavior often gives an honest woman a bad name, no, how, no matter how innocent she is. There are times when I've had a mind to inform my brothers about him, but it occurred to me that men sometimes handle such matters in a way that turns out badly. For their reactions give rise to words, and words eventually lead to blows. So in order to avoid such unpleasantness and scandal, I've kept quiet. But since you appear to be his friend, and since it would be perfectly proper for someone like yourself to censor such behavior in people, whether they're friends or complete strangers, I decided to tell you all about it rather than go to someone else. In the name of the one and only God, therefore, I beg you to give him a sound scolding and persuade him to refrain from what he's been doing. There are plenty of other women who would welcome such things and would enjoy being ogled and courted by him, but as for me, I have no interest in it at all, and I find it exceedingly disagreeable. When the lady finished speaking, she bowed her head as if she were going to weep. The holy friar realized immediately who it was she was talking about, and he was firmly convinced that she was telling the truth. He praised her for her virtuous dispo disposition and promised to handle things in such a way that she would never, never be bothered by that man again. Then, since he knew she was quite rich, he, command, he commended works of charity and almsgiving to her, telling her all about what he himself needed at the time. Please do take care of this, for the love of God, said the lady, and if your friend should deny it, be sure to tell him that I myself was the one who informed you and complained to you about what he was doing. When she had finished her confession and received her penance, she remembered the exhortation the friar had given her concerning acts of charity, and so she discreetly filled his hand with money, asking him to say masses for the souls of her dead relations. Then she got up from where she was kneeling at his feet and returned home. It was not too long before the gentleman paid one of his usual visits to the holy friar, and after they had chatted for a while about this and that, the friar took him aside and reproached him, albeit quite, quite politely, for all the courting and ogling that as the lady had given him to understand, he was convinced his friend had been doing. The gentleman was amazed, since he had never even looked at her and only passed by her house on rare occasions. But when he started trying to excuse himself, the friar prevented him from speaking. Now, don't you pretend to be surprised, he said, and don't waste your words trying to deny it, because you can't. I didn't learn these things from people in the neighborhood. The lady herself revealed everything when she came to me and complained bitterly about your behavior. And apart from the fact that it's inappropriate for a man like you to engage in foolishness of this sort, what I can tell you about her is that I've never encountered any woman who is as repelled by such things as she is. And so, for the sake of your honor and the lady's peace of mind, please stop what you've been doing and leave her alone. The gentleman was more perceptive than the holy friar, and it did not take him long to grasp just how clever the lady was. Consequently, he pretended to be somewhat ashamed and promised he would not bother her anymore, but as soon as he left the friar, he set off in the direction of the lady's house. She had been continually watching out from a little window so that she could catch sight of him if he happened to pass by. 
And when she saw him coming, she looked at him with such joy and affection that he no longer had any doubts about the true meaning concealed in the friar's words. And from that day on, always proceeding with caution and creating the impression that he was engaged in some other business there, he began to take walks through her neighborhood on a regular basis, deriving great pleasure from doing so and giving the lady considerable delight and satisfaction as well. After a while, having ascertained that he liked her as much as she liked him, the lady was possessed by a desire to inflame him all the more and assure him of the love she felt for him. Consequently, having found time and opportunity to return to the Holy Friar, she went to his church where she knelt down at his feet and began weeping. As he watched her tears, the friar asked her, with pity in his voice, what her new affliction was. Father, the lady replied, my new affliction is none other than that goddamn friend of yours, the man I was complaining about to you the other day. I think he was born to be my greatest torment and to make me do something that I'll regret for the rest of my life, and that will prevent me from ever daring to place myself here at your feet again. What, said the friar, he hasn't stopped bothering you? He certainly hasn't, said the lady. On the contrary, he seems to have been offended that I complained to you about him, and ever since then, as though out of spite, he's taken to walking by my house at least seven times more frequently than he ever did before. And yet, would to God that he is passing by and staring at me were enough for him, because yesterday he was so bold and shameless as to send a serving woman to me in my own house with stories and his nonsense and as if I didn't have enough purses and belts already, he had her bring me one of each. <laughs> this made me so angry, indeed it still does, that if I hadn't been concerned about the scandal involved and about maintaining your good opinion, I truly believe I would have raised hell about it. I managed to restrain myself, however, because I didn't want to say or do anything without having first informed you about it. As for the person belt, initially I gave them back to the woman who had brought who had brought them, dismissing her rather curtly and instructing her to return them to him. But then I started worrying that she'd keep them for herself and tell him I'd, I'd accepted them, something I believe such women do on occasion. And so I called her back and in a fury snatched them out of her hands. Now I've brought them here to you so that you yourself could return them to him and tell him that I don't need his stuff because thanks to both God and my husband, I've got so many purses and belts that I could bury him under them. And here's where I must really beg your pardon, Father, because come what may, if he doesn't stop doing this, I am going to tell my husband and my brothers, for I'd much rather have them give him a rough time, if that's what's going to happen to him, than have my reputation suffer on his account. And that, Father, is just the way things stand now. She finished her speech. And while she continued to weep bitterly, she drew a very beautiful, quite expensive purse and an elegant costly little belt out from beneath her cloak and threw both of them into the friar's lap. Fully taken in by what she had said, he was filled with the utmost indi indignation as he accepted them from her. My daughter, he said, I'm not surprised that you're disturbed by what has happened, nor could I possibly reprimand you for your reaction. On the contrary, I commend you warmly for following my advice in this affair. I scolded my friend the other day, but he did a really bad job of keeping in the promise he made to me. And so partly for that reason and partly because of what he's done more recently, I'm going to warm his ears for him to such an extent that he won't give you any more trouble. And you, God bless you, you shouldn't let yourself get so carried away by your anger that you say something to your family about this because something really bad could happen to him. Nor should you worry that your reputation could be harmed by any of this, for I will always be here to offer the staunchest testimony to your honesty before both God and man. The lady made a show of being somewhat comforted by this, and then, knowing just how greedy the friar and his kind were, she switched the subject. Father, she said, for the last few nights, the spirits of various relatives of mine have been appearing to me. They all look 
as if they've been going through the worst torments, and they continually ask for alms, especially my mama, who seems in such a state of affliction and misery that it's a pity to see her. I think she's suffering terribly from watching the way I've been persecuted by this enemy of God. Therefore, I should like you to say on my behalf the 40 masses of St. Gregory for their souls, together with some of your own prayers, so that God may release them from that penal fire. And having said this, she slipped a florin into his hand. The Holy Father was happy to take it, and after he served up many good words and exemplary tales to reinforce her piety, he gave her blessing and sent her on her way. Not realizing that he had been hoodwinked, the friar summoned his friend as soon as the lady was gone. When the gentleman arrived and saw how upset the friar was, he realized at once that he was about to receive some news from the lady and waited to hear what the friar had to say. The latter repeated what he had said to his friend before and once again rebuked him with angry words, scolding him severely for what the lady said he had done. The gentleman, who did not see where the friar was going with all of this, denied having sent the purse and belt, albeit half-heartedly, so as not to undermine the friar's faith in the story, just in case she had in fact given them to him. But the friar, who was quite heated, exclaimed, How can you deny it, you wicked man? Here, take a look at them. She brought them to me in tears, and, if, and see if you don't recognize them. Yes, indeed I do, replied the gentleman, pretending to be deeply embarrassed, and I confess to you that what I did was wrong, but now that I see how, how she's inclined, I swear to you, you're never going to hear another word about this. There was a great deal more discussion, and eventually that dumb sheep of a friar handed the purse and the belt over to his friend. Finally, after admonishing him repeatedly and getting him to promise never to meddle in such affairs again, he sent him on his way. The gentleman was absolutely delighted, both because he now felt certain that the lady loved him and because he had been given such a beautiful gift. Upon leaving the friar, he went and stood in a place from which <laughs> he could discreetly allow the lady to see that the two objects were in his possession, something that made her very happy, and all the more so it seemed to her that her plan was working better and better. The only thing she was still waiting for in order to bring her work to its conclusion was for her husband to go away on a trip, and not long afterward, it just so happened that he was indeed obliged to travel to Genoa on business of some sort. That morning, as soon as he had mounted his horse and ridden off, the lady went to the holy friar and after a great deal of complaining said to him between tears, Father, listen, I really can't take it anymore. But since I promised you the other day that I wouldn't do anything without first speaking to you about it, I've come here to offer you my excuses in advance. And just in case you should think that my weeping and complaining are unjustified, let me tell you what your friend, or rather, that devil from hell, did to me this morning, a little before Matins. I don't know what piece of bad luck led him, to s led him to discover that my husband went to Genoa yesterday morning, but today, at the hour I just mentioned, he got into our grounds, climbed up a tree to my bedroom window, which looks out over a garden. He had opened it up and was about to enter the room when I awoke with a start. I got up and was all set to scream, and I would have done so too, but as I listened to him explain who he was and beg me for mercy, both in God's name and in yours, I kept quiet because of my love for you. Since he was still outside, however, I ran, naked as the day I was born, and shut the window in his face, after which I suppose he made off, and bad luck go with him, because I didn't hear any more from him. Now you can judge for yourself whether such behavior is seemly or permissible, but I personally don't intend to put, it, put up with it any longer. On the contrary, I've already endured far too much from him for your sake. Upon hearing this, the friar was so very upset that he did not know what to say except to ask her over and over again if she was sure it had not been someone else. Praise God, replied the lady replied the lady, as if I can't distinguish him from another man. It was he, I'm telling you, and if he denies it, don't you believe him? Daughter, said the friar, 
All I can say here is that he's gone much too far with that bad behavior of his, and you did the right thing in sending him away. But since God has preserved you from shame, I implore you to take my advice this one more time, just as you've taken it twice before. Instead of complaining to your family, leave everything to me, and I'll see if I can restrain this unbridled devil who I used to believe was a saint. If I, can, if I can succeed in stopping him from behaving like an animal, all well and good. But if not, I now give you permission. Indeed, you have my blessing to do whatever seems best in your judgment. Well, look now, said the lady. This time I won't upset you or disobey you. But you'd better see to it that he takes care not to bother me again because I promise you that I am not going to be coming back here to you again because of this. And without saying another word, she left the friar, making a show of being furious. She had hardly gotten outside the church when the gentleman arrived and was called over by the friar, who drew him aside and gave him the worst dressing down a man has ever received, calling him a disloyal traitor and a liar. Since the gentleman had already seen twice what this friar's scoldings amounted to, he waited attentively and then did his best to draw him out by means of ambiguous responses. Why are you so angry, sir? He began. Have I crucified Christ or something? <laughs> Look at this shameless man, cried the friar. Listen to what he's saying. He speaks just as if a year or two had passed, and because of that lapse of time, he'd forgotten all about his wickedness and dishonesty. Has the injury you offered someone this morning between matins and now completely slipped out of your mind? Where were you earlier today? A little before daylight. I don't know, said the gentleman, but wherever it was, news of it reached you pretty quickly. <laughs> That's right, said the friar, news of it did reach me. And I suppose you thought that because her husband was away, the good lady wouldn't hesitate to welcome you into her arms. Well, here's an honorable gentleman for you. He's turned out into a night prowler, a guy who breaks into people's gardens and climbs their trees. Do you think you're going to conquer this lady's chastity by constantly soliciting her and clambering up trees at night in order to get in through her windows. There's nothing in the world she finds more disgusting than your behavior, and yet you won't stop trying. Well, leaving aside the fact that she's shown you her disapproval in so many ways, it's clear to me just how much you've profited from all my ad ad admonitions. Admonitions, the fuck. But let, me <laughs> but let me tell you this. <laughs> so far, she's kept quiet about what you've done, and not out of any love she feels for you, but because of all of my entreaties. She won't do so any longer. However, for I've given, however, for I've given her permission to act as she thinks fit. If you should bother her again in any way, and just what are you planning to do if she bothers you? Having grasped enough of what he needed to know, the gentleman took his leave of the friar after having done his best to calm him down by making him many fulsome promises. Then the following night, at the stroke of Martins, <laughs> am I saying that wrong? Um, he entered her garden and climbed up the tree to her window. Finding it open, he entered her bedchamber and as quickly as possible threw himself into the arms of his lovely lady. As she had been waiting for him with the most intense longing, she gave him a joyous welcome. Many thanks to Messer Friar, she said, for giving you such good instructions about how to get here. Then, as they took their pleasure of one another, amusing themselves to the immense delight of both parties, they had a good laugh as they talked about the asinine stupidity of the friar and made all sorts of disparaging comments about, <laughs> about distaffs full of wool and combing and carding. Later on, the couple arranged their affairs so that without having further recourse to mess or friar, they spent many more equally pleasurable nights in one another's company. And I pray to God in his holy mercy that he will lead me and all those Christian souls who are similarly inclined to the same happy conclusion, the end. All right. that, was, that was something else, guys. Thank you. So we're, ju we're just going to talk about it for a few minutes and take some audience questions. So what, one of the things that I took out of that experience was just how well this 14th century text still works in the room. It's pretty funny. Uh, but the irony, obviously, of doing a stage reading is that this movie was entirely improvised. So, Jeff, tell us a little bit about 
how you went about choosing from a hundred short stories which bits and pieces you wanted and kind of figuring out you know your own template for doing it given the approach that you took sort of like the way you mentioned um there's a lot of parts of it that still work today that i think are still funny um so the first story i read i, I took the general idea of that and used that as the framework for the movie itself about a guy who has to pretend he's deaf and dumb in order to work at a convent where um, the nuns are have a really short fuse and are really pent up and aggressive and then um, I took other bits from other stories that also I thought was really funny. Like for instance, the um, the the guy sleeping with the the king's wife, and then um, you know sneaking out, and the king goes and checks everyone's heartbeats, and then cuts off their hair, and then he tricks them by cutting their hair. Like all that stuff, I thought was really funny. Um, most of the Cameron is, uh, I mean, it's incredible. Not all of it's funny. So some some of it is is not as funny. It's like there's some really dramatic stories. There's like stories of like fighting and. Um, but I, I sort of clued into a couple of stories that I thought had a tone that I thought was really kind of jubilant and fun and um, sort of like you said, timeless, where the, the comedy is still working. And I just try to sort of figure a way to craft a story using some of these items as well as sort of going in the spirit of it and sort of coming up with my own stuff that, that would capture sort of the essence of, I guess, like the, the, the humor and sort of the humanism of the original material. And actually, I, I kind of lied. There is a bit of a spoiler in Dave's uh, story in the one that you read, but it, it unfolds a little differently in the movie itself. But Dave, you don't come from an improv comedy background exactly, so what was it like to find yourself in the midst of this kind of production where you know the script was not really a script at all? Is this working? Yeah. There. Yeah, I mean, I've I've done... I've done elements of improv in in past past comedies I've done, but like not to the point where there's there's literally hasn't been a script, and so it was really scary going into it. Um, I remember that was my biggest hesitancy, but then just kind of hearing about everyone he cast, that just makes my job easy um, when I'm surrounded by some of the best comedians in the world, where all I need to do is react to what the crazy stuff they're doing and they make me look a lot better than I naturally am and so <laughs> that's my secret that's yeah true. yeah also I'd say like the um the idea of the improvisation it's not like the the whole movie we were making up as we we're going along it was a really detailed we had like a 28 page outline so it wasn't like we were just sort of like let's see what happens like we we knew where every scene was going and what everyone was saying it was just sort of finding a way to have the actor say it in their own words as opposed to have something imposed on them so it wasn't like, you know, let the zany, like, experimental theater exploration thing where we're like, let's hold hands and jump off this cliff. It was, <laughs> we kind of knew exactly, I mean, especially since we shot this out of order and we were in another country and we didn't have a lot of room for things to kind of go off the rails as, you know, as much as sometimes you can afford. So uh, it, it wasn't like that, that improvised in that sense. Aubrey, did you want to add to it? I was going to say, da we were all in the same boat. Like, we all had to do the same thing. And um, I felt the same way about Dave because, yeah, we all had to kind of work together to figure out what the scene was. And um, it was intense because we had to do it really quickly and figure it out. But we all worked together. And you were also a producer on this project and, and did a lot of the, the research into it. And my understanding is you came up with the name for the film. So how did that process kind of enhance your understanding of what this film could be? Um... I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I mean, what do you mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> what I mean, what what surprised you about you know when you started researching more into sort of the okay, backstory? Okay, so the re a lot of the research the research that we were talking about that I did was like, um, you know, there's a bunch of prayer services in the film, and Jeff had written the kind of story almost broken down in the prayer services that nuns in the convent uh, follow throughout their day. And that combination of services um, are called the little hours. And so that's where the name came from. But so I w when we were talking about research, it was like I was kind of literally reading the Bible and, um, and like just starting from the beginning. <laughs> that was for my own thing. But um, 
but then I went online, <laughs> and then I used the <laughs> internet for the other part. And, um, and that part was kind of like just figuring out, okay, like what, do the, what would those nuns have been saying at 6 a.m. You know, in the chapel? Um, because like, there was no script. So I just was like, okay, like John C. Riley's character will say this, and then we'll all do a responsorial psalm. And it was interesting research for me because I grew up Catholic, and I grew up going to ch church services all the time. So that stuff kind of like rushed back. And I was like, I remember this one. <laughs> Rush back in a positive way or? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like weird how your brain works. And then, you know, you can access right. memories. It's crazy. <laughs> I've heard of that. <laughs> so <laughs> so let, we have time for just a couple questions from the audience. If you want to shoot your hand in the air, we can probably accommodate you. Anything about the movie or the, the text? Do you want us to read it again? <laughs> Do it in reverse order, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Back here. Go ahead. Did you guys like the stories that were built the camper? What's that? Did you guys <laughs> like the stories? Did we like the stories? Did you like the stories? Did we like the stories of the original Decameron? Did you like it, Dave? Yes, that is uh, part of the reason I wanted to do it, because I like the stories. Um, did you like the stories, Jeff? I, I love the stories. I went to NYU and I got a major in, in filmmaking, but I got a minor in medieval renaissance studies uh, like accidentally because I took all these classes at Gallatin that gave me enough credits to give me that minor. And so in this one class, Sexual Transgression in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, we read the to Cameron and I, I just I like fell in love with it. And like I didn't know anything about it. I wasn't exposed to it. And this, the, the humor in it I thought was so fresh and alive and vital. And we also learned a lot at that time what was going on in the world. And it sort of blew my mind how different it was from what we think it is. So the reason why a lot of these stories work is because they're ultimately about people that we can relate to. And I think uh, the way you sort of think about nuns and priests and all these people is like these, there's like robots that are just really religious and don't care about anything else except like, you know, like nuns are, are super into the, the, um, the, like all the kind of rituals and the Bible. And um, and really what was going on is a lot of them were forced there by circumstance, didn't want to be there, and so they were always constantly getting into trouble for doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Like you read the penitentials and there are all kinds of sodomy and, and just sex and drinking and just revelry. And so that sort of tension, which was, was going on even in 1350 when he wrote it, I, I thought that was really funny that that is something that you can kind of clue into when you read the book. So I would like highly recommend reading the Decameron because it's, it's so funny, but it's also so smart and it's got a real point of view. It's a good thing to say when you're in a bookstore. <laughs> yeah, just download the Decameron. No. I was gonna ask you, is the book in the public domain? Was there anything about getting rights to make something like this? Yeah, so the, I think it's like either 70 years or 100 years. If it, this, this book was uh, from 1350, so we were definitely clear. Um, <laughs> It's, it's out there, and so yeah, we had no problem uh, adapting it. Any other questions? Yes. There are audio versions of it that are out there that are interesting. But so the book is the primary way to read it. But the book, you should read the book. <laughs> and then go to the audio versions, right? Uh, why are nuns so angry at turnips? <laughs> angry at turnips? Um, they're just using the turnip as, a, as something to throw. A You're talking about it? in the trailer? Uh, yeah, I mean, the nuns are really angry because sort of like what I mentioned, they are pent up and they don't want to be there. And they're, you know, in order to have that cognitive dissonance of seemingly being religious and caring about what they're doing every day, but simultaneously having real feelings like normal people, it, it causes a lot of tension. And ultimately, they lash out at primarily men because either A, they're attracted to them, or B, they have to pretend like they're not attracted to them. So it's an easier sort of way to kind of attack. And turn up's a funny word. Yes, ma'am. What was your favorite part about filming this movie? Each of you, I'm sure you have all the different experiences. Um, I, I guess one of the uh, one of the reasons why I was attracted to the project is uh, there's a there's a big like you know female empowerment element to it, and uh, my wife has turned me into a huge feminist, <laughs> and. Uh, and so, like, I don't know, it's just like some, there's like some badass women in this movie, and uh, they're all taking advantage of me, and, uh, <laughs> but, but they're owning it, and, and yeah, they're, they're awesome. 
Um, I like the part where <laughs> I did the thing. Um, I don't know. I like so many things. It's hard for me to choose. There, there was one. I mean, this is not like an actual production thing, but at one point, Molly Shannon, it was her birthday. And I mean, first of all, just having everyone in this place was great. Like, we were in the middle of the countryside in Tuscany. All these guys were here Allison, Micucci, John C. Riley, just everyone you could think of that you just want to be in a beautiful place with and eating great food. And so it was Molly's birthday, and we got her this one cake called Amelia Folia Cake. And um, she was in her full Mother Superior outfit. She like took a bite of the cake and just started screaming and like ripped her clothes off and then jumped over a mountain, like literally rolled down a mountainside and came up and we all thought she was dead, but she was alive and came up and was like spinning in circles, you know, laughing maniacally, spinning like rolling around the ground. And she was like, "That cake is so good." It was really. <laughs> it was r lunchtime is the answer. <laughs> lunchtime was really fun on this movie. That was one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Yeah, like we were in an old convent with a view, uh, like you'll see, if you've seen the movie, the view is insane. And just the, the Alps are in the background and there's this beautiful tree. It's spring, like it literally just turned into spring. So we did outside and it was like, we were literally under the Tuscan sun and it was like gorgeous and warm. And the food, like you, when you do these movies and you're doing independent films and you get craft services, it is so bad. The food is so bad. And this food was like, it's so hard for it to be bad. Like it's so good. The food was delicious. So like we had great food, great company. We were in a great place and it was just awesome. We have time for one or two more. Yes. Um, even though the work itself is based on Catholicism, did you bring in any other influences like drunk Jesuits or other religions outside the Catholic spectrum? Uh, there is an element of another religion in the movie. Um, and that we, there were, we weren't dealing with Jesuits. I mean, we were dealing with the Benedictines. Um, it was in Italy in 1347. Um, but there was a, one of the things that happened when I went to Italy to scout this out was I met a, a priest who's, who shall remain nameless, who was a very influential priest in the area. He like, had, I think, 20 different churches that he was working with or controlling. And um, this is why like, you, I can't say his name. So he was amazing. And like, I, I got a lot of information from him. He told me you know, back then exactly what was going on in terms of the sexual repression of nuns, how pretty much like a guy would show up to like work on a thatched roof and they would like descend on him with sexual impropriety, like either do S and M stuff or like try to have sex with him. And it was just like crazy time. There was like tons of pregnant nuns. There was like babies being thrown in wells, which is terrible, but there's like all this stuff that was going on. And he was telling me this stuff. And then afterwards I found out about this guy, which was super interesting, which was, he's like 92 years old, sorry. And then uh, he, um, so he, he liked to drink and so he got into a DUI and kind of got busted for it, but they, he's like the local priest that everyone loves and adores, and so they kind of let him get away with his it. His name is... We can't say what his name oh, okay. is. And then a month later, he went into a tree, like crashed his car into a tree, and um, waited like 45 minutes to call the police because he was drunk again. And so he goes to, they bring him to court, and they're like, Father, whatever his name is, um, you can't be doing this. Like, this is really bad. And he's like, Brad. no, no, no. Like, I, 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 I honestly, I wasn't drunk when I got in the accident. Um, I, I got in the accident. I hit the tree. I felt so bad about this tree being hurt that I called these monks that were my friends and they brought me some wine. I drank the wine. That's when I got drunk. And they had these monks come in and lie for him. And so they're like, all right, all right. Like, this is it for real. And so there's these women called Perpetuas. They all look like kind of Vincent Gardenia and they, they like carry keys and they look like, like creatures. And they sort of like always like, they're like the office managers of these churches. Like literally you can point them out, like they're in every single church. And so generally they're women and uh, the, the council or the town council or the, the government, whatever, were like, okay, this father cannot be having women and, and alcohol. So they came up with a solution. They're like, we're going to get um, a Muslim man to be his perpetua, which like would kill two birds with one stone. Like he wouldn't have a woman to be tempting him. And a Muslim ostensibly doesn't drink because it's against the religion within three or four weeks, that Muslim guy got a DUI. And so like, yeah, so this, so like that kind of inspired me in the movie for one of the characters that's a priest because it was so funny, but also so human and, and great, so. Everyone wants to know who that priest is now. <laughs> so we have time for one more. Yes, in the way back there. How long did it take you to edit this? Um, it didn't, I mean, it took, I think, two months or something. I mean, it's, yeah, like, once again, going back to that improv thing, like, it's not like we were up there and, like, figuring the scene out from scratch when we were shooting. It's just, it's, it's literally just a, sh a way for actors to perform their dialogue without it 
being written for them specifically so that when they're talking, it's coming more from them. But they know, every actor knew what they were, where they were going in each scene, what the purpose and, and sort of each beat that we're kind of trying to hit in the scene. So it really wasn't like we had 600 hours of footage because we couldn't afford that and didn't have the time for that. It was more just like, we did maybe two or three takes, and once we kind of locked into what it was, we just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. And there wasn't that much, it wasn't like there were all, so there wasn't that much variation. So the movie is opening this week here in LA too, I believe. Yeah. Um, people should go see it. it. Makes a difference to buy a ticket for these things. And uh, fortunately, I don't think you guys are going to be doing readings in the theaters. But we're glad that you got to do that tonight to kind of set. Yeah, the so we're all going to. Uh, it's at the Sunshine Theater on Friday night. We're all going to be there. And then on Saturday night, Allison Brie and um, Kate Micucci and maybe some other surprise guests will be there. So you should all check it out. Sunshine Theater on Houston. On the Lower East Side. They, they know where to find it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for sticking Thanks, around. Guys. Thank you.